Welcome back to the Muddy River Tactical Podcast. This is going to be episode 8, and this week we are talking about personal protection. And not that we are judo masters or kung fu warriors or anything like that, but we're talking about how you can be safe, whether it's at your home, out on the road, at a store, just safe in your daily life, things you can do that may prevent your chance of being a victim. And that's really what it comes down to. That's what concealed carry at its heart really is. Trying to keep yourself safe, especially with the uncertain times we live in. You see police departments under a lot of scrutiny right now, a lot of defunding the police, lots of stuff out there where certain groups of people would rather side with the uh, attackers or the perpetrators of violence versus the victims. So, We're going to try and tell you things, in our opinion, that can help you stay safe, keep your family safe while you're out and about on the road and at home both. Before we get too far into it, we're going to kind of do what we always do. Did Kevin, I know you've got a heck of a ordeal. We talked about it briefly last week where Julie and Bob are going to be beekeepers now. Yeah, so they woke up Saturday and went to... Warrensburg, hour and a half from us for a beekeeping class. I think they both thought it was going to be pretty straightforward and they came back, sounded like a biology lesson, but how much is involved in it uh, is just crazy. I, I don't understand any of it, but they seem to enjoy it. So we'll see. She ordered bees last night or this morning. So where does one go about ordering bees? That's one of those. I don't even ask type of situations when i was talking to bob this morning he's like well you got to get a swarm i was like so do you go find somebody who's got like an infestation some, in their house some people catch a swarm yeah, somehow well, but i'm not going down that yeah, road we yeah. have friends that they have a swarm in a tree every year that we go and get a trash bag and get all of it for this one beekeeper local so I don't do you know try who... and just get the queen is that the <clears> idea i have them all you gotta yeah. take them all Real. yeah the queen but is if what you... they follow but if, if you the have queen, queen dies your thing's gone yeah well, and the other thing Bob was telling me about this morning, I had no idea. But he's like, you can get a mite infestation. I was like, bees get mites? And he's like, oh, yeah. And Talking about burning the whole box and everything. And I'm like, well, if we burn a $1,000 bee box, we're not starting over again. Well, <laughs> I was giving him a hard time this morning. He's like, you're going to have twenty five grand in equipment to make three grand in honey eventually. So, If we make $100 in honey, I'm going to be impressed. Hey, we got good viewers. If you, if you got a jar of our honey in here, we may sell some. You know, that's a Brett and his boss department. But mm. I, I'm out of that because that's a, what, a USDA food deal? I'm, nope. Yeah. <laughs> Maintenance, right? Maintenance, that's yeah. right. Maintenance guy, yeah. yeah. So when the hive breaks, you get to go rebuild it for him. Yeah. You do anything fun, Brett? Um, not really, no. My basement flooded. We had some pretty massive storms here lo- locally during that hell storm and all that. <clears throat> so I just emptied out my basement after that and... We went and worked on a, we got a new boat this year, and so just went and got it ready, started up. So when are you going to take us all fishing? Probably not. Re- remember, you can't take that pretty boat <clears throat> in the woods, he said. Uh, so well, it's a fishing ski. It's a fishing boat, and he won't take it in the damn lake where the fish are. Well, I just got a tube to pull behind the boat, so we're going to do an episode live from the lake, and you're going to drive the boat, and we're going to go tube, and it's going to be great. I would be absolutely thrilled for you guys to ride in the tube behind me, riding the boat. Just Wait, well, you go first. Okay. No, now I have to go first. Okay. Yeah, I need to know how Hey, this could work out better. Since his boat's too pretty to go in the woods, I guess, from what he's saying here, we leave the kids with him out on the main part of the lake where there's no trees, and we go fishing. That, that's good. I've, I've got my boat, too, and I'm funny that you say that. I actually had to work on mine because that hailstorm that came through when I got our dad's boat, I've got a barn that I keep it in all winter. Well, it's kind of a pain in the butt to get... Behind my house, it's got a little bridge, and it goes up a hill, across a bridge, into a shed, or barn, or whatever you want to call it, but it's a real tight squeeze getting it in and out, and I've got neighbors up there, so during the summer when I'm fishing, I just leave it down, park beside my house, and I decided I was going to buy a tarp to do that last summer, and I was looking on Amazon, and they've got a range of them. Some of them are $60 tarps, and some of them are $150 tarps. That's why they call it Amacon. Amazon. I messed that all well, up. I apologize. You can cut that out, right, Kevin? No, we're leaving that. <laughs> well, I've... Brett's stand-up comedian um, <laughs> stint lasted a long time. Good job, buddy. Mm. So I really quickly figured out that the denier 
of the tarp matters. Like mine was a 300 and it's the thinnest thing you've ever seen. And the hail went right through it. So I've got hail all inside my boat and destroyed tarps. I had to buy a new expensive tarp. So I went and got the thickest one you could get now. So mess around with putting that on there. was trying to figure out how to upload Kevin's GPS coordinates for all the crappie beds. And I couldn't get it. He still couldn't catch them if he got there. So. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm, I'm so used to fishing in 38 feet of water with you. I don't know what the bank even looks like. Yeah. yeah <laughs> Tell I me. You. I can I can second that completely. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. for people that may be listening, like crappie fishing 101, what's, what's your top two or top three tips? Not where to fish at Smithville, but like if somebody's listening and they're new to crappie fishing and they've stood on the bank their whole life, what are they looking for? Very first tip, don't go with Kevin. Don't go with Kevin. Okay. I don't know about that. If just I want to catch anything, just because you can't catch fish yes, doesn't mean I, the fish aren't there. If I want to catch any fish, don't go with Kevin because I'm not going to get put where the fish are. I promise I, you. I really don't even know because I'm not a good <clears> teacher <throat> for that. I've just done it so long that it's just normal. So, what kind of bank is it? Rocky banks? Is it muddy banks? Depends on how far down the year it is in the spawn. They okay. move, they move back farther. They so, start on the rocky bank in the front, and then they'll move their way back. And like jig color, we talk about this, and I have to ask you every time, is it dirty water, dark jig? And the dirtier the water, the darker the color, generally speaking. So if you're up in muddy water, you don't want a white jig, generally speaking. You want like black and chartreuse, black it, and green. Does it just look more natural to them in that it's state of water? It's just how the colors offset in the water. And that, that's crazy. And for people that are doing it, when you're crappie fishing, you don't need super heavy line. It's what three, four pound test, or is it? I use ten most of the time. He's bass fish. Bass fishing. Don't don't let him <laughs> yeah. pull you. <laughs> Just so you're not breaking your line all the time. And I, I don't. Brett's seen this. You know how I shoot my rod to get the jig out sometimes. Yeah. When you do that with light line, it breaks your line. And well, we had to learn that from fishing with Dad because if. He never went fishing with our dad, but every time he'd be like, if you get hung up, just let me know. And after about the fourth time he got hung up, you're like trying to get it. You know, he'd have choice words about having to stop the boat again and in the wind. And yep. so Kevin got good at shooting the rod back. It's, it's bizarre to watch. All well, right. That'll be another video someday. Whole nother video. Well, maybe you'll have some more crappie fishing tips for viewers. And hey, maybe we can go live from a crappie fishing trip. That would be a good one. Mm. Brett pissed off because I caught all the fish. And then we'll show him the live well full of fish and Brett saying there ain't no fish well, in here. You need to take Brett just so we have another limit. Yeah. Damn. <laughs> Brett's like taking the kids with you. <laughs> Local conservation agent's taking notes right now. He's like, hmm, follow Kevin fishing. Hey, will you make me a sandwich, Brett? Mm, okay. Give me a beer. <laughs> that was well, a... well, now that he's got a fancy boat, we'll just go back to his boat for lunch. That's even better. You keep cause... making fun of my boat. I'm going to have your wife, my boss, boss, that's all right. You keep get her you on your boat. One. I'll go fishing. I'll I, I, can't, I can't make fun of anybody's boat. I've got a 1989 Bass Tracker, so it's the <clears> finest <throat> technology from 30 years ago in but my boat. You don't need any technology to go on the water and catch fish. Just take Kevin with you. Got, got the man-made GPS right there. I can find a couple. Whether you can catch them or not, it's a whole different story, but I'll find them. Well, we'll you see. see that new world record spoon bill? That thing was crazy. Yeah. What was it, 164 pounds or something? <clears throat> Down in, was it down where we used to go? Or I think where it's Lake of the Ozarks. Uh, Part of the Lake of the Ozarks is where it was, I'm pretty sure. Yeah, I saw Missouri Department of Conservation put it on there, and I forget how long it was, but they had like four or five of them holding up that fish. And at first they knew it was a state record, but I think they said it's a world yeah, record. It's a world right? record is what they claim. Yeah, I mean, you get a hold of a 60 or 70 pound spoon <laughs> bill, you got your hands full. Imagine one of those. Yeah, one of the few. But it's probably so big, it probably <clears> doesn't have much fight to it i wouldn't guess where did where did we go that real narrow spot down by east of clinton over there oh warsaw or not T- taborville or yeah taborville something like that so they went up there but it's later and it's more like at the end of spoonbill season late or late to mid-april they move farther up the river and it narrows down so they're in theory way easier to catch up there so the last time i went it dad and grandpa were still alive and we we're in my grandpa's boat and he can't jerk the rod anymore so he's driving and it's what 40 yards wide through there some spots yeah yeah but it's not a super so it's a pretty narrow little channel and dad and i are sitting facing backwards and just yanking on the treble hooks every yeah, never 10 been feet. 
Never been spoon. So if you get a so. rod that looks like a broom pole, and what what ounce weights are those? They're we, huge. We should go. They're huge weights and giant. We can take your boat down there. Yeah, let's do it. And giant treble hooks, like the biggest treble hooks you've ever seen, with a huge lead weight, and you just drag it along the bottom, and every what twenty yards or so, you just rip it. Well, I mean, you can jerk as much as you want. I mean, but the, in theory, the more you jerk, the more chances you got. So you're but just, you'll wear your ass out. Yeah, you're too. just ripping this treble hook through the water on the bottom because they sit down on the bottom and feed. And you're just trying to snag them. Oh, so you're just snagging. Okay. You're just snagging. That's they snagging. don't bite bait. Yeah. And so, I mean, I've been yanking all morning. And we're kind of going down through there. Well, I looked over my shoulder, and there's a sandbar we're coming up on. And I'm like, Grandpa, we're getting ready to hit the sandbar. He's like, ah, oh, I know how this lake lays. So Dad turned around and he's like, Yep. Dad, there's a sandbar in front of us. Like, God damn it. You know, <laughs> I, I've been here however many times. There's no sandbars here. He's like, Dad, I can see it. We're about 10 feet from it. He's like, no, we're not. <laughs> up on the sandbar. But the the biggest one I ever caught down there was like 38 pounds or something. And it wasn't as much fight as you thought. Like, I think it depends it on where you snag them at, too. You this snag was like, them in the tail. That's a whole different. Yeah, I got this one more on the side, and it was like pulling in a log more than anything. I mean, well, because they'll they'll roll. Yeah, and, and then they roll themselves up. But if you get them in the tail, you better hang on. It, it does kind of feel like jaws. Though. I mean, you got the huge <laughs> pull, and I know you can't. It's weird because you can't keep any of the eggs or anything like that. It's just the meat, and you have to like fillet them before you leave the lake and stuff like that, isn't it, Kevin? Yes, and, and I never really cared for the spoonbill much some people it's like anything though i've never had it cooked where it was good but some people love it it's really fishy the best way i had it was my buddy cj we were at his family's got a guy's weekend every year and his uncle had caught a bunch of it and he cubed it up into like inch cubes and coated it and then deep fried it like you would crappie or anything and it was really good that way I think it's when it's real thick. It's still super fishy and not not my favorite, but yeah, well, and I think you gotta let it soak quite a bit to get all that oil stuff out of it. It's real oily. Yeah. All right. Well, that'll be our fishing tips for the week, and <laughs> we'll bring you more of them as we come along. Maybe talk about <clears throat> finding some morel mushrooms and Kevin's hot spots for that, and any other tips he might have for us. This week, like I said, we're talking personal protection and staying safe in your daily life. Across the country, there's tons of police departments that are facing crisis level staffing shortages. And that's for a lot of different reasons. You've got political reasons, you've got budget reasons, uh, just salaries, things like that. Uh, COVID had a big impact on it. But this is leading to across the country for emergency 911 calls from the time you call until the time the officer shows up is averaging 10 minutes which leads into discussions I know I have with people, I'm sure you guys do, do also, about concealed carry and why is it important. Well, if somebody comes in here right now and tries to rob you, what do you think is going to happen in 10 minutes between, if you can even get to your phone right then, and the time an officer shows up? So for me, that's where concealed carry is so important. Just having the way to defend yourself in case something happens and I see a lot of people talking about, well, you're just carrying a gun because you're scared something's going to happen. And it's not really that at all. It's To me, it's like wearing your seatbelt or wearing a helmet on a motorcycle or doing these things. It's not you're scared that you're going to get in a car wreck every time you leave. But if you do, it's nice to have it on. What would you guys say to people with that sentiment initially? I think, I mean, now it's even worse than what it used to be. But even before concealed carry really picked up, I mean, if you take police times across the country which it's going to be an average, you know, if certain areas are going to have a way faster time because of proximity, whatever, compared to somebody out in the country. So, I mean, it's all an average, but I mean, you said 10 minutes, even if it's minutes, there's so much that can transpire in minutes. I think for years, even if you're not somebody that can seal carries, there's a lot of people that protect their home with firearms that don't conceal carry, which is great. It's just, people are realizing that more and more of the craziness is happening all the time. So concealed carry has got bigger and bigger, but overall, I mean, no matter what is just always being prepared. And I think too many people put too much 
reliability in someone else, whether that be the police department or who's concealed carrying or anybody else. So it's not just pointing out the police department, but they go, well, there's this many people concealed carrying now. I don't need to, or the police department's right here. Why do I need to protect myself? Well, you, in this day and age, you can't rely on everybody else is, would be my biggest takeaway on any of it. So you're absolutely right. And I, I look at it a little bit different. I look at it from a the criminal side of it. Where would I like to partake in a criminal activity? Not where the cops are. So if I'm as a citizen, you know, carrying a gun, protecting myself, they're going to take their shootings are going to happen where cops are not, you know, most likely. Now, don't get me wrong, the parade stuff like that, you know, big events like that. They know there are cops there, but there's so many people. You just it's it's not a controlled environment at all. But the people that carry, that are, should be carrying, you know, that train and practice and do everything else, I think there's a lot of that goes into it. But I think it's, you just got to look at it like that. Do you want to be your own protection or do you want to, like Kevin said, rely on somebody else? And somebody else doesn't mean just the cops. It can mean another person with concealed carry. It's it can anybody. Mean, yeah, it can be anybody. Anything. Yeah. You, you don't want to rely on somebody else because everything, every step – in that situation, if you call 911, every step is time. And that's time, you know, the old talk, the old uh, shopping spree shows in less than 30 seconds, they had to run around the store and get a whole bunch of a product and carts. Look how much can be done with a, a firearm in, in 30 seconds. 10 minutes is a lifetime. Absolutely. And <clears throat> you talk about, you know, the rural areas and <clears throat> a lot of these police departments that are getting defunded or not even defunded because defunded is more of a political thing to appease target voters and stuff like that. But a lot of police departments that have been forced to shut down and transfer small towns and transfer their coverage to local sheriff's departments. It's weird because in researching for this episode, you wonder how the crime is going to translate. Is it going to be more crime because of this or less? But a lot of these rural areas that are having to shut down like Humansville, Missouri, or, you know, you pick little 500 person town that shuts down their police department. The crime rate really doesn't go up, but I think that speaks to the effectiveness of like you talk about, Hey, everybody here's got a gun. I'm not breaking into Brett's house here. He lives out in the woods. Mm -hmm. It's probably not the best target environment. <clears throat> well, that's a good point because the places that are, probably longer response times are more of the places that don't get messed with as much, you know, and it's just kind of weird how that happens. But the more people that protect themselves, the less it would happen all the way around. But what do the people do? And like, was it Philadelphia, I think, or one of those cities that just announced that they're not going to answer calls from <clears throat> like 3 a.m. to 7 a.m. or something like that. It's like, so you're just on your own. Yeah, it's a free for all. So what if I was a criminal and I was going to do something? What time am I going to pick? Well, in Philadelphia, you're already seeing videos of people like gas stations hiring armed guards with AR-15s to stand out by the gas yeah. pumps to make sure people don't get robbed while they're filling up their car. Yeah. So I mean, if you have to take it into your own hands, I mean, at that point, it's just well. And if you think about it, in my <clears> eyes, <throat> and this will be different for everybody, there's both sides of the gun debate, even not just concealed carry, just guns in general. But why are those people calling the police? The police are <clears throat> friends of ours. They're no different than any of us. Yep. Their, their job is to go protect you. Why are you calling them? Because they have a gun and protection. Yep. It's the same exact thing. Mm -hmm. And people somehow get in the thing of thinking that just because they're police, they're somehow superheroes. I know we know all of these guys around here. They're me and you with that job. Yep. You know, it's no different. So the things that you could do yourself to, to, to protect yourself, you could do already. And I would tell people, obviously, you know, we're more on the firearms, pro firearms side of things. But if you're somebody listening who maybe you, you know, have done something in your past where you can't have a firearm, there may be certain things you can get. I'm not sure what the rules for people are, but there's different things you can do. You know, there's, pepper spray, stuff like that, stun guns. And again, I don't know the rules for, you know, felons or people, you know, in their specific situations, but there's other options or even for people who may not want to have a gun, 
I would advise everybody to at least have some way to defend yourself. And if you look at COVID, in my opinion, why COVID sold so many guns is because those people finally realized that, hey, maybe the police aren't going to protect us. I mean, look at the people like even Kansas City, let alone all the other the riots and stuff going on. People just walking in stores and nobody's stopping them. It finally gave them a thing to realize, hey, maybe I'm not protected as I thought by everybody else around me. I mean, it's it's getting political, so they're just not, their hands are tied, you know? <clears throat> so the, the police shortages, like, like we talked about, they're on overnight shifts, so they're cutting overnight shifts or limiting the number of officers. A lot of, like I said, people are turning over to the county. I know the uh, story I was looking up was WHAS 11, and they're out of southern Indiana, Washington County. They will have no officers on duty from 11 p.m. until 7 a.m. And again, that's typically out in the rural areas where it takes longer for cops to respond anyway. So now this rural county will have nobody on duty. So I don't know if you have a situation at midnight, are they going to call in the nearest city? Well, like I was talking to Kevin this morning, his house from St. Joe would probably be the closest. You're a 30-minute drive, even if the guy's Mm -hmm. sitting there ready to go. Well, yeah, I mean, you take, even if they come out of Platte County here, right by the shop here, they're 15 minutes to my house, if they're sitting in their car waiting. Uh You know, I mean, there's so much to that, and that's why the whole police thing is just a sad thing, because they're grossly underpaid for what they do. It's so political on what they can or can't do or get in trouble for doing their job. Um until that changes, I don't think the police shortage is going away. It's probably going to get worse, which is what we're seeing now. So, and then being an election year on top of it, not to go down the political rabbit hole, but their election years and stuff always forces that issue even more. And yeah, you can't blame the guys for not wanting to do that when they could go work at any warehouse job and make what they're making to deal with all that. And yeah, and just in my personal experience, my first two years of college, I was going for an administration of justice degree. Started working armed security and started getting a taste of the lifestyle. And I'm like, I don't know that this is for me, which is why I got out of it and started filling oxygen and started driving a truck. I was like, I'm making 20 grand a year more driving a truck than I would be working nights, weekends, you know, mm-hmm. dealing with all the stuff, getting shot at, being accused for everything you do. You know, rightfully, wrongfully so. I've know guys who are cops, and they've been put on administrative leave for stuff that should have been an open and shut deal, but they almost lost jobs, you know, almost because they hurt somebody's feelings. And just that climate and, you know, the prosecutors are, I know in New York, doing cashless bail on people. So you've got people pushing other people off subway platforms in front of trains and getting out the same day on cashless bail. So where's the deterrent, especially in these major cities, and then you get down to, like down by our farm, down in Bolivar. I know the Polk County Sheriff's Department, I think they were hiring new deputies at like 18 or $19 an hour. Well, you can go anywhere today and make 18 19 bucks an hour. So you're just really ruling out a lot of your prime applicants. So it's kind of has a snowball effect. You want the best of the best to be your cops. And nobody hates a bad cop more than a good cop but you're ruling out the number of people you have. And it kind of goes back to, you know, what we talk about our tax dollars in the schools and where we send money, you know, for sure. If you think about those hours that they're, they're cutting stuff, you know, 11 to seven or whatever, I'm sure a lot of the major, major stuff happens at night, even if it's bar fights and whatever, not major stuff, but would you want to be a one cop walking into a huge bar fight? Mm. You know what I mean? Like that's a terrible situation even with the one cop being there. I I know for years that the highway patrol has had trouble more so than other agencies getting people because you're a man out on an Island. If you're out, you know, on I 70 in Kansas, you're by yourself. Yeah. You you might not have anybody for 20 miles. And the same thing we're worried about response time for concealed carry. And like the point of this show, they're worried about it too, because you're a man on an Island and you can be John wick or the best Navy seal, but you know, that doesn't mean, you know, the bad guy's only got to be right one time with the bullet and you're done. Yeah, it's just putting them in a in a bad situation to begin with. And that's the sad part about the whole thing. It's making them a job and not a career. You know, that's 
it's kind of like working at McDonald's back when we were in high school. It was a job to get you through high school. That's kind of what the eighteen, nineteen dollar an hour police job is becoming. And you're not gonna get. I don't know. I don't know how to say it politically correct, but you're not gonna get the smartest people hiring. You know, hired on at eighteen dollars an hour. Anymore. Well, and that kind of leads into the <clears throat> one of the stories we're gonna talk about today. Fox News out of Austin, Texas. Well, foxnews.com were reporting about Austin, Texas in general, or specifically. They're on the brink of disasters. Police shortages hit crisis levels. This kind of started because they voted to defund the police in 2020. Now, defund doesn't mean they're not paying them at all, but this article specifically mentions they didn't want to have racial concerns or be targeting people. So they did things like defund their gang task force and stuff like that that could be seen as going after a certain group of people. So they defunded, and I'll look it up here, but I think they cut, yeah, they cut 34% of their total budget, and it was in things like the gang task force, etc. But by doing that, they're now having to have SWAT guys, detectives, the anti-gang people go work the streets because they've had 40 people just get fed up with it and retire within the last year alone. They've also got... Theirs is the 10-minute response time also, but you're looking at resignations are up 47% and retri- early retirements are up 19%. So you've got guys that have done this forever and they're like, nope, can't do it anymore. I'm getting out. And it's really sad that it's come to that. I know in 2019, uh, NBC News, I, I didn't write it down, I should have, but the department they were talking to, um, their applicants are just dwindling. In 2019, so pre-COVID, pre the George Floyd stuff, they had 35 applications for one open officer spot. At the time of the interview, they had four open spots, but they've only had 10 people apply for four spots. So again, it comes to watering down. You're not getting to pick the best qualified guy. You need somebody there. Fill, just body to fill the position. Well, and then like you're talking about the gang task force and all that stuff. Those guys are going after known um, issues and people that need to be off the street, mm-hmm. for sure. So if you look at it in the way of, and I'm not saying one's better than the other, but your dedicated talent group of this is what they do. So those gang members go off and get in trouble. Well, all those guys are on there. like You have nobody to go after them. Every day, those guys that those task force are going after are on the street is another day somebody can die. It's another day... For another crime to happen, it's just it keeps them on the street. Well, and it snowballs where more and more of that starts happening in your city because you can get away with it there. They're going to go to that city to do it because there's no repercussions to but it. But guys, their feelings are not hurt. Okay. Yeah, yeah, I won't <laughs> go down what I think. <laughs> go down what I think should happen. But. Yeah, and in this article, it was for uh, down in Austin, and I'm not sure what. Um, group of the fraternal order of police but it was the vice president joe gamaldi down there he said there's no one left to fill the shortages because the city council treats our officers like scum now response times are over 10 minutes for emergency calls and some districts are left without staff the city council should learn their lesson over violent crime 2021 was the highest ever recorded murders and since then the murder rates continue to stay close to that high and it doesn't look like 2024 is going to be any better It says people are dying over bad decisions. And that's at the heart of what it really all comes down to. And just like any other news story, people want to pile on to the popular thing. And I think most people, and I don't know whether it's, you know, just because it's politicized and on the news that makes it seem like a bigger deal, but we've all known cops our whole life. And we deal with them on a daily basis. And I'd say 99.9% of them are great guys, you know, just salt of the earth want to do the best for people and it's just unfortunate how it gets portrayed like everybody's out there and you know not to go too far into it but even if you want to talk about like the george floyd thing and kicked it all off there's a lot of evidence that that was a fentanyl overdose he was known criminal had drugs on him and from to me what it seems like ate it ate the drugs to try and avoid going to jail and you know you go from there but that's why Rogan was actually talking the other day. There's, and I need to find the exact one, but they've got an adopt a cop program for jujitsu and I'll find the exact website because it was really cool, but it was a cheap thing where you could donate 
a little bit or a lot of money, and it goes all to getting police to a blue belt level of jujitsu. And they recommend that because that's it's not really combat fighting, but it's using your opponent's strengths against them. So it's a lot of grappling, a lot of wrestling. It's not, you know, you're not going to be Chuck Norris or what's his name in Roadhouse doing the back kick. Not Kurt. Uh, going blank. But yeah, I mean, you're not going to be the best judo fighter ever, but it'd be really great, especially like for female officers or, you know, smaller statured people, anybody really, because you can get people that are a lot bigger than you. And if you can use their body weight and leverage against them, you'd probably defend yourself where maybe the firearm wouldn't be the first. And that's kind of what their theory is, is some cops are more scared and, you know, readily available to go to firearm as a first option. Can we get a Muddy River Jiu-Jitsu team in, like, to go in or what? Yeah, as long as you're the poster boy of it. Hey, I'm, I'll be the poster boy, but I want all of us to <laughs> blue belt, is what you're saying? Blue, blue belt. belt, yeah. But to, to that point, if you look <clears throat> like police of the old days, per se, those guys, and I'm not saying that everybody should be, but they knew they would get shot. Nowadays... These guys know they can't shoot them. They know they can't tase them. Mm-hmm. Well, and that's they what, know that. And that's why you got people out there, everybody's cell phone, and they are daring the cops because everybody's looking to sue the police and get rich and not have to work anymore. So when you talk about the you know, jujitsu and all that stuff, it's a great thing because the faster they can just take somebody down in the least volatile way, it just gets the whole situation over with. The longer it goes with them recording and the back and forth that's when bad stuff happens you know it escalates the whole situation well and even i know i heard i don't know if it's rob o'neill or it was one of the seals i was listening to the other week and they teach all those guys jujitsu and it's because you're in a house and even with a gun somebody can hop out of a closet and they're wrestling guys and trying to restrain them and even those guys are trying to be as less lethal as they can and yeah i mean that's nobody's goal or shouldn't ever be anybody's goal. You never want to ever have to use your gun. Whether you're a cop, civilian, it don't matter. The military guys don't want to go. They don't go looking to go over there to go shoot everybody. You know, it's just, it's not what they want. So any way to make that better. So to interject on the jujitsu thing, I learned something this weekend, and I can't believe I made it to almost 41 years old without knowing this. So I've got a friend who is a black belt in karate. And was for years, you know, can break the board allegedly and all this stuff. Well, she was telling me, she's like, oh, when I went through this belt and then she starts talking about her camo belt. I was like, you are a liar. There's no such thing as a camo belt in karate. She's like, yeah, I swear I was a camo belt. I'm like, if that was the thing, I would have known about it years ago and I would have called it the redneck belt. And I would have went and done karate so I could say I was a camo belt. So I start looking it up. You know, there's honestly is such a thing as a camo belt in martial nope. arts. Nope. So we're going to start calling that the redneck belt. So maybe instead of blue belt, we all need to get redneck belts. All I can think about when you talk about having the muddy river team is Brett and a pair of those uh, Napoleon dynamite where he's like, you want to take a roundhouse kick while I'm wearing these pants? <laughs> but the, the American flag. Yeah, pants. the American flag. Uh, Rex Kwan. <laughs> <laughs> I was thinking Kung Fu Panda, but. Maybe Damn. we can do Kung Fu Panda in Rex Kwon Do pants. Together, yeah. It'd be pretty good, Brett. You guys are brutal. <laughs> I'm going to have to watch Kung Fu Panda again. What they have? They, they had like a tiger and a snake and uh, I, ever since I've seen it. I don't know. All I can see is Napoleon Dynamite. It would be, he trained to be a cage fighter. Come on. Oh, yeah, Kip. Kip. Kip, Kip was going to be a t- cage fighter. I forgot about that. So, again, we talked about, you know, kind of some of the reasons for the shortages, and we're not going to go too far down them. You know, everybody's got their own opinions, but I think even the most left-wing person or the most right-wing person could all agree that we need some sort of order. We need some sort of police to keep people safe. How we go about that's a, you know, discussion for a entirely different show than ours. But what we're focusing on is what you can do to help yourself from being a target because we can sit here and complain about it all day. It's not going to matter. The politicians are going to do what they're going to do. You know, we can put our voice out there, say what we think, but we just have to deal with the circumstances we're in. So what can you do to minimize being a target? I think it goes number one to Kevin's train and be prepared. 
would be the first thing I'd say. Yeah, and that goes all the way from firearms training, obviously, which is what we're into, but also just situational awareness on where you're at, what's going on, you know, different entrances, exits, all that stuff. Because like we talked about, like on the parade thing, it's not always a self-defense situation. It's sometimes it's a get out of there situation, you know, just being prepared and knowing what's going on around you can make you see all too often nowadays, and we're all guilty of it because everything we do is on our phone or computers, including this for podcast and video and blah, blah, blah. You see people walking down the street nonstop with their head down their phone. There's so many things that you could could have possibly seen ahead of time to get you out of a situation that you walked right into because you're paying no attention to your surroundings. You just, everybody's got too comfortable. And I seen a meme on Facebook and it was funny. I seen it last night and it just made me think about it. But how how the world is what it is because everybody's used to doing doing and saying whatever they want and not getting punched in the nose. <laughs> from from social media, phone, you know what I mean. In the old days, you'd go get your ass whooped. Where now, oh, you can say whatever you want and you can't do nothing to me type of thing. It's too happy world, absolutely. Yeah. So when you're at home, it when we were getting ready for this episode, it made me think of, you know, protecting the house. And it, I went straight back to Jeff Foxworthy, like late 90s, had that totally committed stand-up album. And he had one of the funniest things on there. He's talking about how guys have different strategies when it comes to home defense. He's like, some guys like to have the nice manicured lawns and, you know, keep the shooting lanes open. And he's like, me personally, I like to let the grass grow this tall. So they don't even know there's a house behind it. And then I'll have a motor swinging in the tree and a dog chained to the front yard. And he's like, you know what that says? That's a house where a gun lives. And if you want to know what kind, just come in after dark. And there's, you know, you joke about it, but there is some truth to that. And there's some things you can do. To make your home a less appealing target. For sure. Some some of the things that I would say, <clears> you know, I in my neighborhood, I drive through all the time. There's people with their garage doors wide open all the time. Well, all that does is let everybody that drives by know that you've got this car or that bike. Or, you know, you'll see people with their gun safes or deer heads in there. All sorts of things like that. You know, kind of the same thing along the lines of the garage door open. Leaving your blinds open. We do during the day. Once it gets dark, we close our blinds. And I know a lot of people don't like that, but it's just one more thing where people can see and watch you know what you have inside. So things like that can really minimize, you know, your risk of being a target. Well, and outside of that, I would also include just the social media presence. Absolutely. It can also be a huge thing because not exactly what you're talking about, but there's situations where, some people are more active on social than others and whatever they see what you got, or you see some of those investigation murder shows where the kids flaunting money and post it on oh, Facebook absolutely. and then ends up dead that night. Like, <clears throat> you One, know, don't put yourself out there for everybody to see everything that's going on. That social media is huge and I hadn't thought about it, but one thing I do is no matter when I go on vacation, you won't see pictures until I get back. And I'll put, hey, we just got back from Jamaica because if I post today pictures on the beach in Jamaica, that's telling everybody who's got access and it could be people that follow this show. It could be whoever. Hmm. That I'm not going to be home for a few days and it's a free-for-all. I have a quick one. It's it's not on our list, but out in public, out in public, one thing I really like to do, <clears throat> and my wife makes fun of me for this all the time, but in every restaurant, when I sit down, I always try to face the door. Yep. I always have, and it's just, it's a weird little trick that I've always just... Just watching what's yeah. coming at you? And, and when that brings me into home, she also makes fun of me, because at home, as a man, I usually sleep on the opposite side of the room, of the door, closer to my sit gun safe, I have more time to react. She thinks it's because I'm scared. And I know it's hilarious. The spiders come through the hey, door. This is also the guy that, let's see, on one episode he said he is afraid of spiders. And the dark. The last episode he is afraid of the dark. I think Tabby may be the man in your house. So, she but, might. But I'm telling you, we do the same thing. Michelle sleeps by the door and her thing's like, I want to be close to get the kids. I'm like, that's great because I'm going to be close to get the gun. Yeah. And when you talk about being safe in your house... You, one of the big things, and I had a trainer say it once, and it's very true, 
if you do find yourself in that situation where you've got an intruder in your house at night, number one, I'm going to get to my kids, make sure the wife and kids are okay. And then he always said, you try and be the spider, you know, let them come to you because the spider is not going out looking for the fly. It's the other way around and you know, your house, they don't. So the thing is, if you find yourself in that situation, call 911. And even if you don't want to talk, I've heard people say, put it on speakerphone and just slide it across the floor. Mm-hmm. And then that way it's not making noise by you. You know, most of my weapons have lights on them or lasers or one or the other, but just being ready and trying to defend yourself. And I'm not saying what people should or shouldn't do, but I would be more apt to try and take a defensive role than an attack role. I think it depends though on the house because a lot of people just like getting too comfortable, never think it can happen to them. So they never have a plan. So if something happens in the middle of the night and you have no plan, where's the first place you're going or I'm going anyways, is go get my kids. Yeah. Well, that may not be part of the plan, but that's where you're going, you know? So everybody in the house should be on board with whatever that plan is. And I know some people go, Oh, well, you don't want to scare the kids. Yeah, but you don't want your kids not to be prepared either. And that's part of what's wrong with this world is they want to hide everything from the kids. I was talking to Jenna, had a friend over this weekend, and her dad, first time I met him, he's actually a cop. And believe it or not, he's a deputy in Polk County down by the farm. Really? Now they're up here. But that's what we're talking about is just how kids are raised different and hiding them. And he's like, I know you own a gun shop. And just talking about all that. And he's like, well how they've raised their kids, kind of like what we talked about when we were growing up, not all the time, but like deer season, there's guns in the corner and stuff. We are two years old and we knew not to touch that. Like that that wasn't even an option. Whereas if you hide all this from all the kids, no different than even as simple as maybe you don't let them have guns. Okay, whatever. But from the plan of what could happen, don't hide that from them. That's reality. And if something happens, even a fire, nothing do you have a meetup spot control. outside? Like, what do you do? Because if you have no plan, it's going to be mass chaos when, it, when you have kids in the house. You mean I'm, you mean the kids aren't on their own? No. That's not what you should do? Hmm. And we're lucky. <laughs> and Our house is laid out in a way where my kids have a shared bedroom right next to my wife and I's bedroom. And they're all on the same hall. We got a really long ranch house. But we talk to the kids. If there's a fire, you go outside and... But part of it's reinforcement because before we had kids, my wife and I were in our old house and we had an alarm system and it starts going off at like three in the morning and ADT calls and they're like, the back door in your garage triggered. Is there, are you all right? I'm like, I don't know. So I grabbed my gun and I start going through the house to go check it out. And before I left the bedroom, I told myself, I was like, stay here and whatever happens, don't leave until I come back and get you. So I go check the whole house and the back door of the garage, I think we just didn't get latched all the way. It was windy, blew it open whatever there's nobody there so i come back through the house and i hear something in the bathroom i'm like is there something there and she got up and went to the bathroom i was like what part of stay here she's like well i had to go to the bathroom i'm like (laughs) so just reinforce it with people and go over it but uh, finishing up kind of what you can do at home a lot of people do it now I, i think the days of people not doing it are gone but making sure your doors are locked and secure making sure you've got good locks on your windows We'll help out, help out a bunch. Alarm system, security lighting. We talked about it earlier. Knowing your neighbors is huge. My neighbors know me. I know them. And they pretty much know if somebody's outside my house, it's not. But my house, too, is kind of an outlier because it's really not in a neighborhood. It kind of sits off on its own. But even in a neighborhood, know your neighbors. Be friends with them. Those extra set of eyes. Talking about people who, who can be there maybe when the cops aren't. Absolutely. Then you get to, my last one would be ring cameras. Those things are huge. Everybody's got them now. You can get motion alerts on them. And a lot of times, you know, when the dogs start barking in the middle of the night, before I can even get out of bed, Michelle's on her phone looking at the ring cameras and like, oh, it was a raccoon or we get deer real bad in our yard that the dogs are barking at all night. Well, in like a garage, if you pull in a garage, and this is more neighborhood per se, but how many people get followed home? pull in the garage and they're getting out of the car because they're not paying attention and somebody's rushing them in the garage. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's stuff as simple as, Hey, don't get out of the car until the garage door shut. I I would tell anybody listening to this right now, if you have not seen it, you need to go watch it. 
But if you have kids, especially teenage kids that are starting to drive, or your spouse, significant other, your mom, I would share or encourage everybody to watch the Kelsey Smith video. And if you're not familiar with her, she was a young girl from out in Overland Park, Kansas, or Shawnee, and she was abducted in a Target, Target parking lot. And they ended up finding her, and you know she had been victimized and had passed away by the time they found her. But if you watch this video, the guy is following her through the store. And it took him a minute, but Target had good enough security. They could see this guy followed her aisle to aisle out the store. And it happened so fast, even in this good security photo. She goes out, she's loading in her car, and it looks like a blip goes across the screen. That fashion just shoved her in the car, had a gun forced her into the passenger seat of her car and took off with her. I think parking lots are worse than houses nowadays with all the sex trafficking stuff. Mm-hmm. And Oh, that's huge. Like, if we're at a store, and I even tell Julie, I tell them all to get in the car, I'll put the shit in the trunk or whatever, because I don't want my kids staying in there. It's like... That's the same conversation Michelle and I had, especially with when our kids were young. I was like, you do this, and as I'm loading groceries, I'm watching You them. get in there and lock the door, and I'll be out here. Yeah. That, that's it, and... Because you never know, and people can get you just like that. And it's really hard to keep track of a whole parking lot. And, you know, you got the kids being bad, and people are like, oh, it's fine. I'm just going to do it this one time. And, you know, not to even mention the other dangers of kids getting run over, people on their phone driving through the parking lot. Just that situational awareness to be safe in all aspects of it. The other thing I've seen a lot of is, and it goes around, but different sheriff's departments have posted it, so there's got to be some truth to it, where people will put, like, a sticky note on the outside of your windshield or something where you have to get back out of the car and they'll urge you, especially and it seems like it's during like Christmas time and shopping time when people are trying to rob you, but don't get back out, drive off, use your windshield wipers. Well, they're putting strollers on the side of the road, like on country roads. Oh really? They put a stroller on the side of the road, knowing that people would get out Yeah. and hoping that it would be a, somebody that they thought they could take or wanted or whatever the situation was. But how many moms are going to drive by a stroller on the road and not yeah. get out and not they, want to check it out. And they know that. And it's just a, you got to be not naive to know, unfortunately everybody wants to hope the best for the world, but realize that not everybody in the world wants the best for everybody around them. When you talk about being out driving around, there's a lot of stuff. And one of the biggest ones I see well, a couple of the biggest one is you come up to a stoplight and everybody wants to pull right up in front to the car right in front of them. But what happens if the people in front of you start having road rage and shooting at each other? You're stuck there. Where if you leave a car length, you can get out. Or if somebody tries to carjack you, leave that little bit of extra space. It's really small things like that that can mean the difference in you getting away or not. And you talk about road rage, you know, concealed carry or not, you should never be out looking for a fight. And people... It goes back to saying stuff you'd never say to somebody's face. It goes on in the car just as bad because you're not having that face-to-face interaction with people. So. And that's what I tell my kids all the time. I think Kyle heard, or maybe it's Brett that heard this story. It, my oldest, and this has been a while. This has been like six months ago. But he is in trouble, and he wasn't listening to his mom, so I got on to him. And he won't say nothing to me, but he thought I couldn't hear him walking down the hallway mumbling something. <laughs> well, I came unglued because the whole purpose of Oh, we just lost Kyle's camera. My SD card's full. Damn it. <laughs> you can grab the other one in there while I'm talking if you want to. Uh, we'll finish her up. But the... Oh, hell, I forgot what I was saying. Oh, the whole point of it is, hey, if you're not going to say something to somebody's face, don't go run in your mouth. You yeah. know, no different than the road rage stuff. You see these people flipping each other off going down the road. Then they stop, and then they don't want to say nothing. It's like, well, just keep your mouth shut. You know? well, and at the end of the There's day... There's a time and a place for certain things. Even even if you win, what are you getting? Nothing. You're not getting to your destination any sooner. And is it worth spending time in jail? Even if you just beat somebody up. Do you want to go to jail <laughs> over some idiot that can't drive in front of you? No, just let them go. Let them do their thing and go on. Last couple things I had about in traffic was... Planning your route to avoid bad areas. Driving a truck for as many years as I did, I used Google Maps all the time. And that thing will send you down some of the sketchiest roads on earth through some of the worst neighborhoods on earth. So especially, you know, if you're a you know, lady or, you know, 
whatever. Even for us, even if you've got a concealed carry, there's some neighborhoods you probably shouldn't go to. And that kind of goes down to your responsibility, just being prepared, knowing where you're going, you know, doing a little bit of research. If you're going somewhere you've never been to, maybe look it up, see what people say and find the safe way to get there. Don't just trust what Google maps will tell you. Not only for where you're driving, but where you're going to park. Like if you're going to go down to some place in the city, know where you're parking. You don't want to be walking by yourself back to some little parking lot behind some building at two in the morning or whatever you're doing after a concert, yeah. you know, and parking garages are just as bad. <clears throat> I mean, you're a sitting target in a parking garage. Oh, for sure. How many places people could hide. And I, especially in areas like that, try not to be by yourself if possible. You know, if, if you're with a group of people at a concert, don't go walk by yourself, especially a female, to your car. You know, have them bring you to your car or walk to your car first. Try not to be by yourself in those situations. Well, and Michelle kind of makes fun of me sometimes, but, I mean, you guys see it in Jamaica, especially when I'm out of the country. I'm not going anywhere without a group of people. So, like, when we went shopping in Jamaica, it was all eight of us. And it's mm -hmm. like, we're not leaving without everybody. And yeah. just that safety in numbers, no matter where you're at, makes a huge difference. Absolutely. Some of the best advice I've heard, again, was from another trainer, and he's talking about carjackings. And if you do find yourself, unfortunately, carjacked, he said the thing he tells everybody to do, so if they're trying to carjack in a parking lot and you can throw your keys, whatever you can do to not go with them is better. Because if they're going to shoot you in the parking lot there, they're going to shoot you when they get you. It's not, yeah, it's not going to keep you from getting shot. So try and avoid it. But if they hop in at your car at a stoplight or whatever... The thing he said that made a lot of sense is he tells people to try and get in an accident. So if you can run into the side of a car or a cop car, cause an accident. Because again, if they're going to shoot you, it's happening either way. Or if that's not possible, he tells people to try and hit something hard like a bridge abutment or something that's not going to give that's going to disable the vehicle. And the other part to that is most carjackers statistically won't put on their seatbelt. So they get in. You should have your seatbelt on if you're driving anyway. You hit something hard, there's a chance they might be ejected or incapacitated enough for you to get along. So just something to keep in mind and, you know, maybe do your own research, come to your own opinion. But they're pretty sound facts that I shared with my wife and have kind of told her, if you find yourself in that spot, just be thinking you have options. You know, the last thing I'd tell anybody to do is comply with them and go where you want to go. Yeah, I mean, like you said, if they're going to they're gonna do it, they're going to do it anyways. But a lot more bad things can happen when you're isolated, God knows where with somebody like that compared to in public somewhere. Well, I mean, the best thing you do is just keep an eye out. Like I, I get on my wife all the time driving down the road. She doesn't pay attention to signs, anything around her. She just, she's almost like in a la la land. And you know, that's one thing that she could do better is pay attention. That's not just her. That's it, it's that's the majority I of the mean, people. You can't drive down the road and <clears throat> not see men, women, kid, everybody's yeah. on their phone and, I'm guilty of it as well. We're always, I mean, I'm answering emails 18 hours a day, so I ain't saying I'm not guilty of it, but just I don't think in this day and age we realize how much stuff we do not see that we probably should see. Yeah, the, the dangers are definitely everywhere. And, you know, like I said, it's never too early to talk to your kids about it and just keep reinforcing it. And my kids, we live on a pretty busy street and Every time they want to go outside and play. And when they were little, I didn't. But now that they're a little bit older, I do. But you can ask them before they go out every time. It's like, all right, if somebody's walking down the street and starts walking up into our yard, what do you do? We know, Dad, we run in the house. Okay, if somebody pulls in the driveway when you're out there, what do you do? Run in the house. Okay. But every time they go out there and I just refresh it. And it was honestly funny because Michelle's brother had just got a new Harley. Oh, I think it was last summer. But he was riding by the house. He lived in the neighborhood just up from us. But he comes pulling in the driveway on the Harley. And these dudes dropped the basketball and they were gone. They were like a fart in the wind <laughs> in the house. But I was like, good. And he was giving them shit. I was like, no, don't give them shit about it. That's what I told them to do. They did exactly what I told them to do. So just keep on them because you don't want to wish you'd said something or, you know, that could have kept them safe. Absolutely. So our viewer question of the week comes from Steven on Facebook. His question is, what's the best home defense weapon... And what about people who can't own guns? So it's kind of a two-parter again, which I like these two-parters. But I don't know. Who wants to... What are you guys' thoughts? I'll, I'll start. I personally think for 
home defense pistol, or not pistol, home defense firearm. In my opinion, a shotgun is the best home defense for multitude of reasons. You, your air factor is way less. Your chance of missing somebody with a shotgun are way less. The sound of a shotgun, I don't care if you've been around guns or not, there's nobody on the planet that doesn't go, oh shit, when they hear a shotgun go. Well, and that's you know, kind of, I mean, a pump shotgun. Yeah, that's kind of the early warning system, too. If somebody hears a... And yeah, still if they hear that and they're still going down the hallway, they got yeah. one coming to them. Yeah, for yeah, sure. It's on. Well, so, there's different rounds you can put in them, too. So I'd do more, like, on the shotgun, like a double-op buck instead of a slug. I'm wanting something yeah, that's yeah. not going to penetrate a wall and give me a little bit of spread. And that's where I think on the home defense stuff, a lot of people don't think too much as far as they think, oh, AR is going to be the best. Well, AR is a great platform, but it's going through the wall. So if you're in a neighborhood or you're anywhere, your you kids, kids are in the, the bedroom room. or whatever, it's not stopping on the wall. Yeah. So that's where I go where I wouldn't use an AR in my house. I um, wouldn't. Yeah. Pistol is even. You make sure you have an expanding bullet. Yeah. That's, pistol's bad enough. <clears throat> I'd like to... I can't really add much to the what Kevin said. I can kind of elaborate on the second one, but I do want to clarify the question. Is it that can't own guns or don't want to own guns? could be either. So for somebody <clears throat> who either can't or does not want to have well, a gun in the house. The can't own gun part, you've got knives, you've got pepper Baseball spray, bat. you've got bat- bats, you got maybe not doing anything bad to where you can't own guns is probably be the best Right. Starting solution. But let's get beyond that. That don't want to own guns, the proper plan to lock yourself in place. That's probably going to be your best home defense is, is, you know, statistics show that if you lock yourself behind a door, I don't know the numbers, but it's no different in schools than it is at home. If you, they're less likely to break that door down trying to get to you. They don't have the time. So if they're robbing you, if they're specifically coming after you, then that may be a different story. But they need to have a plan in place of locking themselves in place. And that's, that's what I would suggest. Yeah, and that kind of goes back to being the spider <clears throat> and don't be the aggressor. If, yep. if you're, It's just like playing hide and seek. If you're sitting there waiting, you've got a huge advantage on whoever's coming in. It's why the military does ambushes and they're not out hunting everybody down because they're at a huge tactical advantage that way. Uh, I would have to agree with the shotgun portion of things. Again, research your different loads. I wouldn't put, you know, dove shot in your home defense shotgun. Yeah. You know, is turkey load going to be better? Nothing. Yeah, but it's not going to be as good as a personal defense round. You know, the manufacturing specs are just different on personal protection rounds, and that's what they're designed to do. So, and again, a box of personal protection, 12 gauge is what, 25, 30 bucks? I mean, yeah. you're, you're not in the big picture. In the big picture, you hopefully never have to shoot one of them, so it doesn't matter. You buy one and you got it. But but the other thing I would tell people is to shoot one because I bought a home defense shotgun a while ago, and I shot a few rounds through it, you know, and you should be training with it just like you should be your pistol. Oh, know yeah. where the safety is. Know how it racks. You also, you also got to know if it works. <laughs> I mean, period. Absolutely. You know, functions. Well, like at the house, I got the shockwave is what I got. I got it in a 410 for a couple reasons, but so a, a 410 has got plenty at a close range that it's going to take care of the situation, but it's less recoil in a shockwave. Those not familiar with the shockwave, you're not shouldering it. So it's more controllable and it's short enough. It's got like that gooseneck grip on the bottom instead of a stock, yeah. right? So like if Julie had to use it or whatever, it's not a 12 gauge will knock the shit out of you when you're trying to hold it like that. Yeah. So it's a way more controllable platform. And most of those have rails for lights. I know mine did. Do the shockwaves have those on there? If not, they probably got an aftermarket. They've got all kinds you, you, of parts. You can if you yeah. want. For a home defense, I'm not necessarily too worried about the light because of, like Brett said, I ain't going to search them anyways. I'm, my kids are going to be there, and I know, I'm going to know where my wife's at. So if they come through the door after all that, then that's their own problem, you know, because have a plan for everybody else to be accounted for but. yeah and, and i've seen when you get to the second part of the question what else can you do and i would never recommend this as a sold deal but i've heard people do it um have like cans of wasp spray or something that you can spray in people's eyes air spray because it shoots about what 12 to 20 yeah. feet away 
and yeah. bear spray it's relatively inexpensive again you're 25 30 mm-hmm. bucks and if you've got that or nothing i would take that all day every day over not having anything absolutely so we will get steven another goodie bag kyle tyson got his hats and shirts and was pumped he was our was he? our animal attack expert who proved brett wrong so mm. he got a hat and a shirt for that answer i, I would add real quick just because it came to my mind on the the house and sheltering in place or locking yourself somewhere make sure wherever that is you have a phone correct absolutely make sure you're locked and it seems like common sense but a lot of people don't think about it you know just assume they have their cell phone on them you know make it somewhere where you know you're going to have a phone don't lock yourself and be especially if you're in the country because if you're in the country i mean if you're in the city the chance of the neighbors being able to hear something or whatever but if you're in the country like say my house and I wasn't able to call anybody. Brett was talking about how much time they have. Well, they, they'd have all the damn time oh, yeah. in the world. Because yeah. unless I had it, it'd be days. Or the next day when you guys were like, well, why the hell isn't he at the Well, shop? hell, we, we wouldn't even know. We'd be like, oh, he's just fishing. Again. <laughs> it'd, <laughs> it'd be like a week I was on the excavator or something. <laughs> like, hmm, we haven't seen Kevin since last month. Yeah. But I think all of it boils down to just self-awareness all the way around. I don't think it matters what situation and even with the police, even if there wasn't self-awareness will get you out of a lot of things. Absolutely. And for your specific situation, I'm sure there's a lot of companies that will do evaluations, home security companies. You might have a friend who's a cop, invite them over, you know, have them, you know, give them a few beers. And you know, most of those guys, if you invited them over and said, Hey, what can I do to make my home safer? Just about every one of them I know would come over and give you some pointers or kind of show you your weak spots. So promo code MRT podcast will get you 15% off holsters, pretty much everything on the website. I don't want to say everything because some of the lights may not be most of the stuff on the website. Most of the stuff. Yeah. Same thing in the gun shop. You'll get 15% off holsters. Is that ammo or anything or is it just holsters? Just on holsters on the uh, promo code. I do want to add this week. We just started. Um, we do have a website for the gun shop now. Oh, excellent. Yes, it is mrtgunshop.com. So we'll probably have you add, start adding that stuff to the things, but it just got started up today. Yeah, so uh, bear with us bear on Bear with us on it. It should be up and running right now, but we're, we are growing, you know, so there's going to be growing. And pains. what are they going to be able to find on there? Is it going to be the lights, the holsters? Yeah, this uh, will be. It, will it be like anything like, I don't want to say, Bud's Guns or any specific website. Is it anything for like transfers and stuff too? No, so it's going to be all ordered off the internet. So our, we have four distributors. It's going to be what's in stock and they can order it and, ha- and they can choose an FFL that they want to send it to across the country where they live or here locally. We are not putting our local inventory on it at this time. We are going to get used to the website, get, get everything worked out. And then in the future, you know, shipping and everything else just isn't possible right now with by myself, but we'll get there. Eventually. Well, and we get that question a lot. It's like, <clears throat> where can I go to see what you have in stock? Well, mm-hmm. unfortunately it changes every day. That's a guy in itself. Yeah, updating so, the website. so now you can send them to our website and they can see most of everything I can order. What I have in stock, they just, they'll have all my contact information on the website they can call me. They can get a hold of me there, and that may help us in the future as well. With you know, not calling the gun shop or the holster shop as you know as much. They'll have our information on there. Well, and it helps because on the holster <coughs> side, you know, over ninety nine percent of the holsters are not local, so it brings where somebody else that's a customer of ours that wants to deal with us can buy guns from us. It comes straight shipped to their FFL from the distributor. Buy, bought off our website and then they can still do it that way instead of going to wherever yeah. and that is mrtgunshop.com yes sir excellent again follow us on all of the major social media platforms you'll be able to find us there if you look up muddy river tactical we air these episodes on podcast form and a video version every thursday they come out four o'clock for the podcast six o'clock for the video versions yes Kevin's got weekly gun reviews that are Mondays. Yes. So I tried it. It's been so damn busy. I've tried to do every Monday. I missed last one. The one for this week posted on Sunday. And I think I may switch them to Sunday because on Monday is just a weird day because not everybody 
it's the first of the week stuff going on where Sunday gets better views because the more people are at home and able to watch them. So I'll probably switch it to Sunday, but Sunday, Monday. For the gun reviews. For the gun reviews, but it's always Thursday for the podcast. Excellent. The links for everything we've talked about are on the website. You go to muddyrivertactical.com, and we've got a, I believe it's a videos and media tab, but that'll get you all of these podcasts. Does it have links to the gun reviews also on there? Yeah, so it's got a link to the, like, welcome to the YouTube channel. If you click on there, you can subscribe or just click on the YouTube link and and if you're listening to this and if you can just, if you made it this far and liked anything we've said, if you can take three seconds, run over to any of the socials, Ron, follow us, like us. That is huge for us. It helps get our target market out there more. Share it with your friends. If there's something that you didn't like about it, well, let us know. We'd be glad to talk to you about it. Or if you got ep- or episode ideas, viewer questions of the week are huge. We send out stuff every week to people who just type us a line and, the thing I've heard three times now is, oh, I didn't think I was going to get picked. It's like, well, yeah, and we'll pick him. We'll send it out, and they're and happy. That's what to- we talked about. The longer the podcast goes and the more popular it gets, it'd be nice to have half the show be questions where we're serving the people that are listening for mm-hmm. whatever they're listening. Still have the news stories and you know the podcast stuff, but the more the whole point of this is not to listen to ourselves talk; it's to help you. And. When you're hearing this a couple weeks from this episode, so it'll probably be episode 10, maybe 11, but we are going to have a good friend of ours, uh, Brett, from War Horses for Veterans on, and they do a lot of really cool stuff with first responders and combat veterans pre- and post-deployment, really helps, helps with PTSD. I am really excited for him to talk to the people because I think it's a great resource that I had never heard of until he started going yeah, to work they're, there. They're local to us and we didn't even They're local. Know they're huge. I mean, their facility, when we get them on here and talk about, they have an incredible facility and they've got, you know, special forces guys, SEAL team six guys, you know, operators from everywhere coming in, you know, SWAT police department. So that, that'll be a good one. If you're listening to this, make sure you tune in for that episode. It'll be really good. So Kevin, you want to, Give her the old wrap up. Absolutely. Thank you guys for joining us. And until next time, keep practicing and always be prepared. See ya. See ya.